Hello. Some very interesting events covered by independencelive.net have been happening in Scotland over the last few weeks. At least says I, Robin McAlpine outlined his ideas about how the Yes campaign can win the next referendum. Two important issues, he suggested, are developing an alternative banking system and robust currency proposal. Evidence suggests that this is a very astute insight. In a recent interview, Yanis Varoufakis, Greece's former finance minister, suggested that the fact that Greece chose to join the Eurozone Monetary Union and therefore does not have control of its commercial banking system or have its own currency has severely undermined Greece's political sovereignty and has crippled its democratic political system. Varoufakis's warning is clear. Unless we in Scotland establish an independent Scottish commercial banking and payment system and develop a very well thought through and robust currency proposal, it will be very difficult for Scotland to gain independence, at least without the full support and consent of London. With London as the senior partner in our current monetary union, Westminster and the City of London are pulling the strings when it comes to the practicalities of independence. Mr Varoufakis seems to support this view, saying when asked about why Syriza failed to uphold its democratic mandate to resist European-imposed austerity on Greece, that... They could walk all over us because of the structure of the Eurozone and their capacity to put, press a button and close down the banks. That is why they did walk, how they actually walked all over us, after all, isn't it? Mr Varoufakis also highlighted the weak position a country is in if it doesn't have its own currency, strengthening Robin McAlpine's claim that we in Scotland need to think seriously about a future currency proposal before another referendum. We have to draw the very significant distinction between having a pegged currency and severing the peg and defaulting and being in a monetary union when you don't have your own currency Therefore, you can't divide it. Varoufakis also highlighted the significant difference between withdrawing from a political union, for example, Britain withdrawing from the European Union, and withdrawing from a currency union, for example, Scotland gaining independence from the UK without maintaining the sterling currency union, which at the moment is Scotland's only realistic option. Unless London consents to Scottish independence, and agrees to maintain the monetary union, which it has refused to do. So whether Britain stays or leaves the, Euro, the European Union is not going to be that significant. It doesn't compare to the question of whether a Eurozone member state should stay in the Euro or not. Uh, that is a matter of one's currency. So um, the, the question of Brexit, the, the referendum that David Cameron has called for, is a significant question. It's a very, very significant question. But it's uh, a much lower order of magnitude compared to uh, the issues around the euro. Again, this highlights the difficulty for Scotland that even if in the future we want to withdraw from the political union with the rest of the UK, without some form of banking infrastructure, as well as options around currency, London can always bully us into remaining in the UK, if it wishes to do so. Mr Varoufakis highlights this issue in the Greek context, saying that the European Union, a political union, is a very different beast from the Eurozone, which is a currency union. The European Union is a very different uh, beast from the Eurozone. Uh, the European Union in itself cannot order your banks to be closed in order to get you to bend to their will. The Eurozone is that realm. On cue, the launch of a joint proposal by the New Economics Foundation, NEF, and the Common Wheel for a new complementary Scottish currency with the working name the Scott Pound took place in Glasgow recently. At the event, Duncan McCann from NEF highlighted why the current design of the British pound is bad for the UK economy and presents the case for a Scottish complementary currency and alternative Scottish payment system, which could strengthen the position of the independence movement and create a stronger, more resilient Scottish economy. We look at 
some highlights from this event to get a flavour of what the Scott Pound proposal is all about. First, here's Robin McAlpine talking at Leith Says I. Then the more people begin to see Scotland as an already existing independent nation state. And again, I'm going to give you one more example. We've got in the book an entire, in fact, in the book, we've got an entire section. We've got six se themed sections. And there's an entire one of them which is called Standing on Your Own Feet. Now, if I was calling that what I might have called that in the terminology, I would have called that nation building. But we wanted to be a bit more subtle, so we called it Standing on Your Own Feet. Now, I'll give you one policy from within that to give you an idea of what I mean. It would be quick and easy in the modern world to create a full and complete municipal banking sector in Scotland. Most people do most of their banking online these days. And a lot of the face-to-face -face banking can be done using online approaches but face-to-face. -face. So what you can create is a system of municipal banking in Scotland with every local authority starting a large development retail bank. Um, being able, letting people be able to access that from anywhere that there's a council service. So you can go and pay money into any council service um, and you can get face-to-face -face banking. Now that is the model that they've got in, in both Germany and in um, Japan, both of which countries have a majority of their retail banking delivered by municipal banking. And what does this do? This means that next time during the referendum when the banks say, oh we're all pulling out, we can say, cheerio, <laughs> on you go. Keep moving, because we've got a solid, solid, steady municipal banking sector there, which has created the institutions of a solid and steady nation um, already existing where we are. It's been an interesting conversation in the last couple of weeks in the media between, for example, on one side, Jim Sellers, who says, we need a Scottish currency. And on the other hand, Nicola Sturgeon and Ian McQuarter, who says, well, maybe, but it wouldn't have won as it anyway. And they're both absolutely right, because they're both looking at two sides of the actual issue. The question is not whether we had a Scottish currency or not a Scottish currency as part of the prospectus for Scottish independence. The simple truth is that most people absorbed the sense that it was given insufficient serious attention. Now, that's not unfair, because it was given insufficient serious attention. I um, absolutely understand why that happened. In 2011, nobody thought we were getting a referendum. And then you had three years till referendum, and you couldn't go through that referendum with no answers in currency. Which meant to have an answer in currency for two years of a referendum campaign, you had one year to come up with something. And bluntly, um, with the best will in the world, the, the Fiscal Commission's work was a perfectly, reason, a perfectly reasonable discussion paper. But I can promise you, if you took that policy paper to the Scottish Government and said, here you go, implement a Scottish pound or, or they would look at it and say, interesting discussion paper and go back and do your homework. Okay? So it wasn't that people are all going to read the absolute nitty gritty of a properly worked out proposal on Scotland's monetary position post-independence. It is that people are aware and absorb the commentary from people sympathetic and otherwise who say this wasn't given serious enough attention. And that is at the heart, I think, of what we have to do next time, is to do that. Next up, Duncan McCann at the launch of the Joint New Economics Foundation and Commonweal Scott Pound proposal. But the most important thing is to remember that we don't need to wait for government and banks to allow us to create money. Anybody can go out there and create money-like things. So, now that we've realized that we can go and create money, uh, why would you go and do that? Most people are kind of quite happy with uh, the way the system works and certainly don't feel any de desperate need to go out there and change the money system. Um, but. A lot of that comes from the fact that most people just don't spend much time thinking about the money system, its impacts, its implications. So I'm not going to cover uh, all the kind of flaws that we see in the current money system, but just pick on a few, again, just to highlight why uh, doing something about this is not only good if you believe that Scotland's on a you know, straight line towards independence, 
but it's also good even if you just believe in a prosperous, resilient Scotland who should be uh, who should just be, yeah be innovating and, and trying new things in this area. So uh, the first thing to think of is that the current monetary system uh, and financial system that it kind of sits within is systemically unstable, and so uh, this. A lovely uh, Venn diagram here is from an IMF report um, and so what they catalogued was all the banking crises, debt crises and currency crises that have happened just in the last 40 years. <coughs> and so what you see here is over about 400 different crises that have hit pretty much every country in the world uh, in the last 40 years. So what you have here is a system that is systemically broken. It, it continues to boom and bust, boom and bust uh, without fail is really that we've allowed the banks to monopolize such a huge volume of our money supply, if the creation of our money supply, that it's in fact no longer generating the positive uh, outcomes that it was maybe 100 years ago, but it's in fact leading to lots of, uh, lots of negative incomes. Outcomes, sorry. And so we've given this huge power to the banks to, add, to create all this money. And so what creating this money really means is that they decide which sectors of the economy uh, need kind of investment. It's kind of a way of allocating new money into the economy, where it's important to think about new ways of creating money and new ways of allocating money, uh, because it's diversity in those. It's not just having, we could, you know, if we just created a Scott pound and use exactly the same rules for creation and allocation as uh, the British pound, then we haven't really created a more diverse or resilient system. We've just kind of duplicated a, a similar problem. Um, it used to be, that that was kind of the end of the presentation. It was like, oh, here's a big problem. Uh, well, here's money, and like we could do loads of cool things with it, and then it's a really big problem. But uh, there weren't really many proposals for how we can really move this forward uh, and, and, and really do something about it. So that's really what uh, Neff and Common Wheel were trying to do with this proposal around uh, Scott Pound, is how can we move this forward without a fully independent Scotland? Is there anything interesting that we can do that is more significant than kind of a, a community currency which can have really great benefits at the local level, mm -hmm. but which doesn't really change the, the, the large, the economy with a big E, the macro economy? Um, so we wanted to try and see if we could do anything for that. So um, the idea that we came up with, and you know, I think two things before we kind of delve into exactly the, the exact configuration of an idea that we put together, it's definitely not the only uh, currency that Scotland could implement. Uh, there are lots of other great ideas floating around at the moment. In fact, uh, in a couple of months, we're doing a, a really interesting session at Edinburgh University with four other uh, leading organizations in kind of the alternative currency movement where we're all gonna put forward our own idea and really debate those four different ideas because this isn't just about, oh, it would only work if you do Scott Pound or something like it. It's really about encouraging a debate and getting people to think about what works best for them. It's about having small local currencies, it's about having regional currencies, and it's about having different uh, national currencies. The one that we're focusing on today, and I'll spend a bit of time explaining to you, and then uh, I really want to leave some questions. I've been talking a bit too long, so I'll be, uh, I really want to leave some questions. So it's a new national currency, which again is different to... Uh, apart from maybe the Veer in Switzerland, it would be the only kind of nationally focused um, uh, alternative currency. Um, then in terms of creating and allocating it, we wouldn't be creating it with any kind of debt liability. Um, I won't call it debt free, it's a, it's a term we're debating at the moment because from an accounting perspective, you, you always have to have a kind of liability to somebody. Uh, but none of us would be in debt. The Scottish government would not increase its debt by creating this money. Um, and as you saw how the banks allocate, so they decide to allocate a little bit to businesses, they just allocate most of it to property, and then a lot of it to speculation. Well, we say let's bypass <coughs> allocating it like that. Let's allocate it directly to people. Mm -hmm. People is in fact the most useful way of spending it into the economy, um, especially when we're talking about relatively small amounts as we are on this proposal. Mm -hmm. um, the second bit then, as I was just speaking about, it's, it's then thinking of a payment system as a public utility rather than as a rent-seeking private enterprise. Uh, so rather than creaming 3% off every transaction in the economy, what about if it did 
didn't take anything off every transaction in the economy, and instead we met those relatively minimal costs through uh, general taxation. Um, and then we would want to create a network where people could use this new currency, and that would be both in businesses, uh, uh, for goods and services, and then also for certain personal and business taxes. That's kind of the, the, the overall idea. But, you know, a lot of people find it then hard to conceptualize what you would actually do with this money. And so this chart is just a short explanation of, uh, you know, uh, and the spending uh, 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 for sterling would look very similar to this. Uh, and this is really where all the work goes into creating a currency. So uh, famous economist, Hyman Minsky, has a great quote, which I read out all the time, which is that, anybody can create money, the problem is getting it accepted. And that kind of really is a really accurate picture of uh, uh, the money area. So we could create this tomorrow. I could set up the bank at Alba personally. I didn't, you don't need the Scottish government involved at all. I could create a billion uh, Scott pounds tomorrow, distribute them to people that I knew. But the problem is you wouldn't have anything to do with them and so they wouldn't actually be worth anything. So the, really the bulk of the work, if this proposal would go ahead would be to be creating this network. So we would have to encourage people to want to get excited about the currency, to want to use the currency. We'd have to uh, encourage businesses to join in and accept the currency, but not only accept it, but also then take on board that they would have to respend it. Um, uh, and there can be a whole sort of ways. So, you know, at New Economics Foundation, <coughs> you can get part of your salary paid in Brixton pounds. So it's about paying staff in this, it's about giving change, it's about procuring other goods and services with other businesses. Uh, and then it's about uh, the Scottish government accepting it for taxes, but then also spending it back into the economy uh, as well. And so this would really be where uh, a lot of the work needs to happen and a lot of the, the kind of discussion. But I think generally there's been a lot more knowledge now about the impact of the money system and some of the issues there. And I think a kind of forgotten sister issue of money is then the payment that about 64% of small and medium businesses in the UK, and it's only a UK figure, I assume it, it plays out pretty, uh, <coughs> even in Scotland, do not take digital payments at the moment. Whereas large businesses, so your Tesco's, your Sainsbury's, these kind of guys, not only will they take digital payments, they negotiate lower rates, and it basically creates this double advantage for large businesses over small businesses, where one, they accept digital currency, <coughs> and there's research that shows that people really want to pay, people want to pay digitally, and will not go to shops, will spend, will not go to shops that don't take digital payments, will spend more in shops that do take digital payments, but also those that do, then the SMEs lose more money than the, uh, than the large businesses. So it's basically these payment systems create a kind of double advantage for large businesses over small and medium businesses. And so that's the other thing that we wanted to try and look to resolve with uh, the Scott Pound proposal was thinking about, well, why should the payment system be a private infrastructure? What if the payment system was like a public utility that we all use in the same way as the NHS and things like that? And what would, that, would there be benefits for the economy if we looked at it like that? Um, well, the FCA was a very kind of... Excuse me, can you repeat the question? Oh yeah, so what was the, um, what was the feelings that I got when meeting the Bank of England and the FCA and stuff like that? Um, so from the FCA perspective, it was a very dry discussion about is, is this within the regulatory powers of the FCA to control? Is this e-money? Is this a payment system? Uh, and interestingly, it is neither e-money <coughs> nor a payment system under the regulations, which is very interesting given that it's electronic money on a payment system. But uh, uh, the, 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 technical, uh, the technical language that the, the regulations use clearly put these kind of systems outside of the scope. So um, the FCA hasn't given a full, like, this is out of scope, but from the, you know, they basically confirm my understanding that this would be out of scope of anything the FCA looks at, and they wouldn't be controlling it. So the FCA is just kind of like, oh, that's very interesting. Thank you very much for sharing. Uh, the Bank of England, so the Bank of England now has a digital currency division. Mm -hmm. So it has five people employed purely to look and understand the digital currencies. Mm -hmm. um, and so we got to meet with that team. Um, you know, they were very uh, caged about obviously what they can say uh, at this early time. 
Um, you know, what I did ask them to say was if there are any fundamental objections that you're going to come out with, you know, immediately, that they would please let us know uh, out of courtesy. And we've developed a really good relationship with them. So uh, they come to us when they do announcements and ask them to check our text. And so we've had a good, you know, we've got good cooperation. They've also just employed um, a guy called Michael Kunghoff from the IMF, who is a really forward-thinking economist who is proposing things along the line of positive money for those of you who... Yeah. Um, but, you know, he goes even further by wanting a $10 billion jubilee and things like that. So, uh, And he heads up the kind of digital currency research. So they're very, very interested. Um, I could see their jaws drop because they, they did a report on lo local currencies um, just a while ago. And the Bristol pound, which is the biggest one that we did, that when we were saying that on day one we were going to create a billion, his head was just oh, wow, that's actually quite different to 250,000, you know, circulating in a in a town, um, in a city. So it will be really interesting to see. And some of the questions this morning at the Scottish Parliament are on the same lines. You know, are they going to try and block it? <coughs> it's really hard to sell. Mm -hmm. I think that, uh, you know, the Bank of England and Treasury would have to expend a lot of capital. They'd have to almost come up with new regulations mm -hmm. to block this. And I think that they would feel that that was tactically a poor move because yes. it would really play into the hands of those <coughs> who see the Bank of England as an enemy and, and just general Westminster as an enemy. Mm -hmm. So. I'm really intrigued as to where the Bank of England is going to go on this. Mm. Um, I don't think they're going to let it go completely unsupervised, mm. but neither, I think, are they going to put their foot down. And mm. uh, uh, much as you know, Bank of England faces a lot of criticism. They, are, of all the central banks, they are one of the more progressive. Mm. If that's uh, you know, <laughs> not an oxymoron. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah. so we, uh, an add-on question. The full Scott Pound report is available for free download from the Commonweal allofusfirst.org website, linked to below. Robin McAlpine's talk, along with other talks from the Leith Says I event, including from Leslie Riddick, Mike Small, Ivan McKee and Ian Black, are available for catch-up at independencelive.net. The full interview with Yanis Varoufakis is also linked to below. New events are constantly being added to the independencelive.net website. To keep up to date, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, on our live streaming page, and on YouTube. And if you found this video informative, please share it with your friends. Thank you for listening.